you can uh, turn to page 30. We're going to finish up notes for chain rule and then uh, we'll spend the remaining period um, working through the review. There is a review in the packet. What you just picked up is the morning review. So we're not going to do that in the class. I'm going to have you guys take go home and work on it for extra practice or uh, you come in tomorrow morning and uh, I'll have a health session at 730 in the morning. So you can either wait for me to do it with you tomorrow or you work through it. Tonight, as extra practice, the key is attached. And uh, I had a help session last year that I recorded, so that help session uh, video is on the website. So if you want to put in the time to go through that review, you're more than welcome to do that. So uh, I just want us to go through page 30, and then that way we can finish up the notes and um, we can look at the review. Uh, let me just recap example three. Um, find the equation of tangent line. So we, we did this, right? We did this problem at the top. OK, yeah. uh, so we talked about how numerator and denominator, we can go through quotient rule, but anytime your numerator is just a, a simple constant, it's a lot cleaner and easier to just go through chain rule by pushing that denominator up to the top. And that way, the four can just be part of the parentheses, can be part of the, the expression, can be part, can be part of an outer function. We don't have to go through chain rule, sorry, quotient rule, because that four is really just a number that um, doesn't have to stand on its own. So we talked about how uh, this cannot be expanded. We have to rely on chain rule and, um, and recognize the outside and inside portion of our function. Outside is whatever is uh, to the left and to the right of the parentheses, which is four parentheses and negative two, and the inside function is the x plus two. We take turns with the derivatives, outsize derivative, we go through power rule, bring down negative two, merge with the four, negative eight parentheses to the negative to the negative three, multiplied by the inside function's derivative. So x plus two becomes one. Do some cleanup, and we have our slope formula, our derivative. Uh, now we want to gather our order pair. Our order pair comes from the original function. Insert negative three into the original function. Get our order pair, negative three comma four. Insert negative three into the derivative to get our slope. And then finally, point slope form. Okay. All right. Um, some of the more involved problems with chain rule includes ones where we have to merge with other uh, rules where it's, where it's not just chain rule that's going on there's multiple rules going on so if you look at example four here there are there's actually two rules that we have to involve um or two processes that we have to involve um what do you see a quotient and and chain right there's a inside portion there's an outside portion we're, it's not going to be easy to foil all this out, right? So we want to identify this as outside inside. So um, we know there's chain rule involved. We know there's quotient rule involved. The question though is, how do I know which one to apply first, right? And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, the way you can decide is you look at the location of your parentheses. Oh, well, for first step. First up, um, you want to apply the rule that has a larger impact over the problem. Okay. So 
the parentheses is going to help us decide which one is going to be done first. If you look, the parentheses is over the entire expression, well, pretty much the entire expression. And so that tells us that chain rule has a larger reach than quotient rule. Okay. So that's going to tell us we're going to apply chain rule first because that has a larger overall impact. And then the quotient rule second. So the larger rule is going to take precedence. And then once we're inside chain rule, then we're going to see quotient rule pop up. Okay. All right, so chain rule first. Which means we want to identify outside and inside portion. First. All right, what's the outside portion? Awesome. Yeah. Parentheses. Parentheses, yep, to the third power. Inside function is what we see is um, with the fraction. All right, so we're going to take turns outside first, followed by inside. Okay, so y prime equals. What's the how do I represent outside's derivative? Mm -hmm. Three. Yeah, three parentheses squared. Good. Okay, what goes inside here? It, the original inside function, right? We don't want to do anything with the inside just yet. That time will come after we get out of the parentheses. Times, now we're ready for the inside function's derivative. And if, if you look at the inside function, now we can apply which rule? Quotient rule. So that's why quotient rule comes next, comes second, because it's inside that parentheses inside our chain rule. So quotient rule, I'm going to set it up. Okay, so f prime g minus f g prime all over g squared. All right, let's start with f prime. f prime is one times the g function. Back to f. And what's g prime? Two x. Nice. All over. On the square, yeah. Now we have the derivative, and technically, uh, that's our answer. Okay. As messy as it looks, it does the same job as other derivatives. All it does is, if you enter in the next value, it'll give you a number, and that number will describe the steepness of the original graph. Now. Um, we are going to have to be able to clean this up, but I want to save that for a different time. Uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time for um, for review. Um, but there's just we're going to have to kind of merge a lot of these together. We're going to do a little bit of cleanup um, just so that we can get to a point where we can pick up another time. But as we clean up, can I ever do this? And I take one of these out. Okay, I can never do that. Okay, so we whenever you clean up, you always are just going to cover your denominator and just focus on trying to get that numerator cleaned up. Okay. So let's just do a little bit of cleanup just with the second fraction. And next time I'll talk about how we can kind of push it together. But ultimately, you've got the most important step here, right? So you found the derivative. Technically, you found the answer. Is rest of, rest of it is just clean up. So we still have to clean this up, merge it with this fraction. OK, and I'll talk about that next time. OK, but the biggest thing is understanding the need for two different rules, understanding which rule comes first, applying those two rules and understanding what you cannot do with um, with reducing. You can never take these out. Okay? As tempting as it is, it's never going to be right. So you're just going to cover up the denominator and force yourself to expand and clean up the numerator. OK, so there's still more work that needs to be done in terms of cleanup, but 
I'm going to save that for a different time. Okay. Now, I do want to talk about example five because example five um, has a similar process, but there's an important difference with this problem. Okay, so example five. Um, let's go ahead and rewrite this problem, right? So that it makes it a little bit easier to work with. Um, how would you rewrite the problem? Say it again. Like yeah, so how would you write it? Use parentheses, right? Okay, so we want to find the derivative of this function. What process is involved? Say it again. Okay, yes, we could bring that denominator up to the top. If we do that, um, it's not as clean as the previous one because there's an X here. Um, if you bring it up to the top, you can go through product rule. But my suggestion is leave it in the denominator because eventually you're going to have to, it's, when you clean up, it's going to be in the denominator anyways. And, I, and um, it's not wrong if you did product rule, but I do think that in this case, um, Quotient rule is going to be a little better. Okay. But we can explore that another time and we can talk about how that looks if you want to bring it up and go through product rule. But say it again, what what was needed here? If, if, if we leave it in this form, we do quotient rule. Okay. And what else is needed? Chain, Chain rule. Because you see parentheses with messiness on the inside, uh, of an exponent that cannot be resolved and it's stuck, right? So we understand that there's a need for chain rule as well. Now, if you look at the previous example, example four, it's also chain rule and quotient rule. So how do we know which one to do first? Right, because they both, they, you know, they look a little different from each other, but we can obviously see the similarities as well. And it's all going to come down to the parentheses. The parentheses is going to kind of help us gauge which one comes first. So. Is parentheses over the entire expression? Yeah. It's not. What that means is that there's a larger rule that has a bigger impact on the problem. So which rule has a larger impact? Quotient rule. So quotient rule is going to be, it's going to take first priority. Once you're inside quotient rule, then that denominator, we can take care of that chain rule for that parentheses portion. Okay, so quotient rule first, chain rule second. So if you look at example four and five, the location of the parentheses is going to help guide which rule you're going to apply first. Okay. If parentheses is over everything, then chain rule first. If parentheses is only over a part of the problem, then it's the other rule first. In this case, the other rule is quotient rule. So we're going to jump into quotient rule first. See what that looks like. Put a big space for G prime because I'm expecting that G prime to be a little bit longer because there's that chain rule is going to take effect there. Okay, so let's jump into quotient rule here. F prime, one. G function, no changes. Back to F. Okay, so now we, when we reach G prime, now we have to involve what? Chain rule. So now we got to involve chain rule. So we're going to identify outside, inside, and kind of do a, a mini problem just within this space here. Okay, what's my outside portion? My inside portion. Okay, so. Let's go through chain rule outside first. One half parentheses to the negative one half. You got so one half minus one is negative one half. What goes inside here? It's got extra minus one. Don't take the derivative yet, right? We want to make sure that we follow the process here. Times now that we have our own space, now we can do what? the derivative of the inside function, right? So make sure 
that you don't jump the gun and take the derivative here, right? Right, the original inside function and then save the derivative for this space here. Everybody go with G prime. All right, divided by what's G squared? One half squared. Now, what's going to happen to that denominator? It'll clean up, right? The one half times two will multiply to be just one. So denominator is just x squared minus one. Okay. So we technically have the derivative, technically have the, uh, a formula. It's not cleaned up like we would like, but we have the majority of the credit right here. We've, we've done all the calculus that's needed for this problem. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, we're not going to quite finish this problem, but I do want to talk about something uh, here. Um, if we clean up, we have to resolve negative exponents. So the question is, can I push this parentheses with a negative exponent down to this space down here? Okay, the answer is no. And why is that? Why can I not push this down here? Because yeah, because it's, it's still. I mean, it's, it seems a little far away, right? I see multiplication on both sides, but ultimately this is still connected to that minus sign. So I am going to put it in the denominator, but it's only going to be in the denominator within this region, which is going to create a complex fraction. Okay, I want to do that portion there, and then I'll save that cleaning up of complex fraction later on. But the, the important thing is your first step of cleanup, you cannot put this down here. We're best we can do is create our own little fraction and put it and clean it up within the space. Okay, so I just want to talk about that one little step and then we can finish up a different time. OK, if I merge um, this little space together, I can resolve the one half and two. What happens to the one half and two? It just becomes one, right? OK, the X and X will become X squared. And then that x squared minus one to the one half can be brought down to the denominator, but it's only going to be in the denominator within this, this little space here. All over x squared minus one. Okay. And from here, we got to find common denominator, merge the numerator portion, and then bring the x squared minus one, and then clean that up. Okay. okay. We'll finish that up a different time, but any questions up to this point? Wait, never mind. Right. Right. But yeah, so our end, you know, there's only a few things left to do, but we're gonna have to find a common denominator here, merge these two as one fraction, and then we've got to bring this up and then try to get it cleaned up even further. Okay. But the most important step is done. We found the derivative and we understand hopefully uh, the distinction between example four and five. These are more complicated uh, problems that we have to um, eventually work towards uh, getting ready for the test. Okay. Okay. But again, we're going to finish this up at a different time. Um, but real quick, actually, before I get to the review, let me just show you one um, quick thing. If you guys can find a space to, to write this down. If I have this function x squared times parentheses x to the fourth minus three x squared to the fifth, this is a complex looking problem. We don't want to expand this. This will take too long. There's also two rules involved here. Can you identify those two rules, those two processes here? Product and chain. Good. Product because you see two distinctly separate terms. And then you also have chain because you have a messy parentheses with terms inside and exponent outside. Which comes first? Good product because the parentheses is not over the entire thing, right? Parentheses is only over a little bit, so you know chain is only going to be a smaller portion. The larger portion is product. So we're not going to do this problem, but I just want to just set it up real quick.
So it'll be F prime G plus F G prime. And when you reach G prime, that's when we do chain rule outside and inside, and that goes into space. Right? But I just want to kind of talk briefly about uh, problems that have multiple layers, such as product and chain or quotient and chain. Okay. I think this knowledge will be good as you guys attempt your homework uh, over the weekend um, for, for Monday, right? All right, let's go to uh, review page. In your packet, page 27. Okay, let's try number one. The velocity of the function is described. By the function of V of T, find the times when acceleration is zero. So notice that the problem doesn't give us position function. Okay. They only they only gave us the problem starting from velocity. Okay. We're not going to be able to know how to get from velocity back up to position. Okay. Not until second semester. Okay. So right now we only go from function to derivative to second derivative. Okay. Next semester we'll learn how to go back up the chain. So you're never going to write this semester. You're not, not going to ask you. I'm not going to give you velocity and expect you to figure out what position is. So the best we can do is use velocity or go one further down to acceleration. So that's what we need for part A, right? We need to find acceleration first before we can figure out the time when acceleration is zero. So go ahead and find your acceleration function. Go through power rule for each of the terms. Bring down the three, subtract one from the exponent. Okay, feel free, guys, to work ahead because there's the key on the next page. But um, so I want to just make sure that you don't feel like you're stuck with the pace I'm going at. All right, find the time when acceleration is zero. Okay, how would you uh, how, how would you move forward from here? Okay, where do I plug it in for T or do I plug it in for A of T? Here, it says acceleration is zero. So we want to make sure that we put the zero in the right place, right? We're looking for time and we're given acceleration. So vector. Solve for T and what do we get? One and three. Okay. Now notice the units are not given, so you're not expected to put the unit down if there isn't one. But on the quiz, read the directions. If there's a unit provided, if it's asking you for a unit, then it, it's going to count for credit. Part B, find the velocity when acceleration is zero. How can I use part A to help me out? Yeah, plug one and three into the. Yeah, good. So you're now inserting one into the T variable. As yesterday, I said no calculators, but tomorrow you will uh, get to use a calculator if you bring one. Okay. You use a calculator on the quiz tomorrow. Okay. So uh, one into the velocity function, I get 10 thirds. I'll, I'll send out a reminder this afternoon about that. Okay. Now, if it was unit provided, if it was like feet per hour, then you'll do feet per hour, right? Um, okay. All right, any questions with one? Number two, the position function of the particle is given in a straight line is x of t. So separate uh, problem here. For t greater than zero seconds, when is the particle at rest? So how do we interpret that? 
What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. So that means I'm going to set V of T equal to zero and then solve for T. So work your way down to the velocity function. Back, uh, factor set velocity equal to zero and solve for T. And now we're given units, right? So we're going to include our include units in our answers. Uh, factor the three out, continue with triangle factoring, solve for T. This particle is motionless when we're when uh, the T time value is two and four seconds. Question for today. Part B, um, during what time interval is particle moving to the right? And then part C is uh, during what time interval is the particle moving to the left? Before we can do any of this, we have to uh, uh, create what? Yeah, let's create a velocity sign line. That way you can get a, a visual picture as to uh, you know everything organized in terms of the intervals of uh, the right to the left and, and your um, particle at rest uh, information all plotted on your velocity sign line. So we'll take that let's take some time to do that. I'm gonna put what I gather from part A onto my velocity sign line. Is there any other number that we can put onto this? Oh, why? Right, the zero, that's the starting point, right? It's a boundary for this problem. So we're going to have to put zero. Now, notice that this is just greater than zero, it's not greater than or equal to zero. So once we create our intervals, we don't have to worry about brackets, right? It's, it's not part of our, our interval. Zero is not, it's just slightly to the right of it. Now we have to be able to populate our velocity sign line. So what can we do next? Yeah, five numbers in between. So I'll just use one, three, and five. Okay. Insert into your factored form. That's the easiest one to gather information that you want. Uh, we don't care about the three. That three is not going to impact your sign. Just the parentheses. So one minus four is negative. One minus two is also negative. Two negatives gives me a positive. I know this particle is moving to the right. All right. Insert three. Three minus four is negative. Three minus two is positive. Negative and positive is negative. Move to the left. Change the direction there. Insert four in. Sorry, five in. 5 minus 4 is positive, 5 minus 2 is positive, this is positive, move to the right again. 
Now, once you're here, go ahead and cross out your test numbers. These numbers are not going to be used at all afterwards, right? We don't want to use those numbers because uh, any interval information is just going to be relied with 0, 2, 4, and vicinity. Okay. We don't want to actually use those numbers because um, we have them down there. Okay. The only purpose of those test points is just to get the sign of the interval. After that, we don't care about those numbers anymore. Okay, so during what interval is parcel is moving to the right? What would you say? Zero two, then fourteen centimeters. Now it doesn't ask you for justification, but if the quiz asks you for justification, you would say because you have t is what. Positive greater than zero. Part C, during what time interval is the particle moving to the left? Two to four, because velocity is greater than zero. Okay. Any questions with B or C? Yes. Uh, wasn't there one problem where like zero was bracket? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why do we not do brackets here? Yeah, very minor thing, right? There's no equal sign underneath. Yeah, so if it's if it's equal to, then we got to test that number, and and potentially it's going to impact that bracket there. Yeah, but greater than it's always going to be good. And the only time you can have brackets is uh, at the starting point. You're always doing parentheses around your um, uh, around your particle uh, times when the object is motionless, and you're always doing parentheses around your vicinities as well. Uh, before we get to number three, let me just do a quick uh, visual here. Let me give you an, another example. We don't have to write this down, but what if I had this? Okay, so if I ask you, when is the particle moving to the left? What would you say? And then to the four. Because velocity is less than zero. Okay, what can you not do? You can't say zero to four. Why is that? There's that rest. Good. So we cannot include two as part of negative velocity because it's not moving there, right? As tempting as it is, sometimes you want to just merge like information together. But um, now there are times where you're able to. Um, but my suggestion is always separate. If you always separate, you're never going to get points off. Um, rather than thinking, wait, can I separate here? Can I merge it together? So I'm just going to say it's always separated and you're never going to be in trouble. Okay, okay good. Uh, number three. Find the equation of tangent lines. So we need to find order pair, we need to find slope, we need to find slope form. They only give us the x value, so I can definitely use the original function to get the y. But let's go ahead and get the calculus step out of the way. Let's find the derivative so we can find the slope. So if I want to find a derivative, what do I have to involve here? Torsion rule, right? There's no way around it. I got the torsion rule. Okay, so f prime g plus f g prime. F prime. Okay. Function. Back to F. Okay, what's G prime? One. All over. One is good. Okay, let's do some cleanup. 
but can I ever do this? No. All right. You need to cover up the denominator because you're not going to be able to do any cleanup there. All you care about is just trying to get that numerator cleaned up. I have my derivative, which will get me to my slope. I have my original function, which will get me to my y value. Get my for the pair, get my slope, point slope form. Okay, any questions with part A? Okay, part B, find the equation of the tangent line to the curve where the slope is equal to negative three fourths. We're using the same function, we're using the same derivative, but a different process to get to our answer. What's different about the way that uh, they gave us information for part A versus part B? We already have the what? Well, we have to work backwards to get to the point, right? This this feels more straightforward, right? Because I can take that x value and plug the derivative and get the slope. But this one feels a little bit a little bit uh, harder to kind of wrap our heads around. But we're still going to use the derivative, but we're using derivative in a different way. Okay, so let me write the derivative function out. Okay, I'm gonna. On a separate So, how can I use that negative three fourths to help me? Move forward with finding my point. Good, because my this is my slope, right? And slope is another word for derivative. So if I take that negative three fourths and give it that slope value, I can turn around and figure out the x. Right? Remember, the the derivative can, can do one of two things. You can either give it a location and ask for the slope. You could also go the other way around. You can give it a slope and turn around and ask for the position right? or ask for the location. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to insert that negative three fourths into the slope slot and work backwards and solve for x. If I can solve for x, then I'm back to where I am for part a. I have my x value, I can find my y value, and then my slope form. Okay, so. Slope goes here. So now I'm just going to solve this algebra problem here. Cross multiply. I can multiply this out, or I can just take a shortcut and just take away the negative threes, right? Divide both sides by negative three. I can just have an easier equation to to uh, to work with. Okay. 
Okay, we could do a square root and do plus or minus, but I find it a little bit cleaner if I just expand all this out and boil. But if you want to do square roots, that's fine. So we got to fold this out, set equal to bring everything over to one side, set equal to zero. Factor. Multiply to be five, add with the negative six. We got negative one and negative five. Solve for x, I have x equals one and five. Now, what does that tell us? About this graph behavior. There's what? Two, yeah, there are two different locations on this graph where the slope is negative three fourths. So what that means is we got to worry about two separate Cantillon equations. Okay. So two separate categories here. So at x equals one, we got to find the order pair. The slope of negative three fourths, and we'll create an equation for that line. And also we got to worry about the other point, which is at five. Also, the same slope, right? We've already determined that. And then point slope one. Okay, so how can I find these y values here? Back into the original. Yep, back into the original. So one over one minus Any questions there? Okay, try number four. Now, number four, look at number four for a second. We have two options here. It's up to you. Which two options can we use to find the derivative? Power rule or product? Yeah, we're going to do power rule. Distribute everything through, clean everything up, go through power rule, or if you go through product rule, the first term is your F, your second term, first is your G, F times G plus F G prime. Now, on my key, I worked it out using product rule. So here, I worked it out using power rule. Choose either one. Your answers will look different, but whichever way you choose, you can just match it up with, uh, with the steps that I took. Right, so try number four. And number five, what's number five going to be? Guess what? Just power rule. You have to do a whole bunch of cleanup, but then once you get everything cleaned up, just rely on power rule to get through here. Okay, so try that. Try four and five. And I'll put the answers up for four using power rule. Get the back on the key I have using power rule. Choose either way. It's up to you. Yes, yeah, for either power or product rule, I would remove the radical because for F prime, you do want to see that one third. Yeah, so all the conditions still the same. Uh, you don't have to clean up your, your messy fractions, but if there's any negative exponents, you do want to resolve them.
Um, I added the exponent, so this is really awesome. But in order for me to multiply uh, bases, I got to add exponents. In order to add exponents, I need common factors. 